Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our session on Future of Development Cooperation. My name is Stefan Klingebiel, German Development Institute, and I'm very glad to moderate this session uh, today. Just a few points um, to kick off uh, the discussion. Uh, four points, actually. The first one is uh, development cooperation is increasingly responding to different crisis situations. Just thinking about the pandemic, uh, just mentioning uh, the migration challenge, at, le at least or with the main focus on Europe, but also a number of refugee situations, consequences of climate change, and of course, conflict situations uh, like in Afghanistan and of course, Ukraine. My second point, and this is related to the first one, is um, we pay less attention to long-term sustainable development. My third point is, and this is also related to the first two points, um, uh, uh, the geostrategic context is much more important today for development cooperation than five years, 10 years ago. And uh, um, just to mention it, um, we all talk about South-South cooperation, but South-South cooperation is also seen in this geostrategic perspective. Just thinking back five or 10 years, I think, South-South cooperation was just regarded as something what is great, uh, solidarity of the South with other Southern countries. Nowadays, we have those debates like, um, oh, how is China using the Belt and Road Initiative? And this kind of uh, uh, attitude is, is quite, quite different. My fourth and last point is, and of course, this is related to the first three points, um, we pay today much less uh, emphasis on traditional questions related to effectiveness of development cooperation. Does it work? Uh, I mean, this is a traditional question related to, to development cooperation. Um, I think we have uh, a great opportunity today to discuss uh, related questions uh, with a great, great panel. So we want to discuss um, um, what kind of need to reform uh, development cooperation do we see? Uh, do we need to replace development cooperation by something what is different? And how far do we need to adjust the narrative of development cooperation? I think typically we, we are quite quick to say, oh, today the context is very different, but when it comes to the operationalization and strategies, we see that we typically continue what we did already for the last a couple of decades. So those discussions, I think, are really highly relevant. We have a great panel here today, um, uh, two online uh, panelists and two great panelists here, here in the room. I just uh, read out in the order of appearance. Uh, we have Pilano Tembu. He's the executive director of the Institute for Global Dialogue in South Africa. Good morning, Pilani. Uh, we have Annalisa Prison. She is a senior research fellow at uh, Overseas Development Institute, ODI, in London. We have Andrea Ordonesh. Uh, she is director of Southern Voice. Uh, it's still very early for you. Good morning, Andrea. And uh, we have uh, Deb Batachava. He is distinguished fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. And, uh, he played and still is playing a very important role for South of Voice uh, uh, as well. Um, so um, let me start with an opening round, um, asking you those fundamental questions. What is the future of development cooperation? Please do not use more than three, maximum four minutes for your first intervention. Uh, if you go beyond uh, those four minutes, I will let you know. and. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll stop you actually. Uh, so Pilani, uh, over to you. What is your response to uh, this question? Uh, greetings, <coughs> Stefan. Um, I think the future of uh, development cooperation is one that is much more pluralistic. It uh, has a, a greater degree of uh, flexibility. It is more pragmatic. Um, there are a greater number of uh, stakeholders, both state actors, but also non-state actors. And I think the future of development cooperation is moving away 
from um, one dominant narrative, one dominant set of practices. Uh, it is one which embraces um, a greater degree of perspectives. Uh, and it is one that is more rooted in the development needs and priorities of countries that we have uh, called recipients. Uh, some of those countries are no longer just, uh, let's say, uh, recipients of, of development cooperation. They are also actively playing a role as development partners in their own regions. And therefore they assume a more partnership role. And lastly, I think the future of uh, development cooperation is one also that recognizes that um, uh, the challenge of poverty and inequality is also highly concentrated, not only in uh, countries we've called least developed countries, but also in uh, middle income countries and also in um, uh, not only in the global south. So development challenges are ones that are being confronted also in the global north. And so the future of development cooperation is uh, much more uh, exciting, I would say, because it actually sees even the possibility of Southern actors working with Northern actors uh, to actually share potential practices of dealing even with challenges, development challenges that we even see in Northern countries. So it's a much more diversified landscape that we are seeing unfolding. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Pilani, uh, for, for a great response. Let me just uh, follow up with one or two quick questions. The first one, this kind of plurality of actors, of narratives, it sounds rather positive what we are saying. Um, is it also in a way negative? Um, you can also call it a fragmentation of uh, actor landscape, a fragmentation of narratives. So um, we were not able to, um, to really achieve all traditional development cooperation objectives. If we have even more objectives, uh, what does it mean? Um, so maybe a quick response to this, Pilani. Well, I think it's important to maintain a common um, agreement around, for instance, we agree on the sustainable development goals. We agree on what needs to be done. However, the plurality comes in when it is how do we actually achieve those sustainable development goals. So yes, we could see it as a, a, a sort of fragmentation, but I don't think it's necessarily has to be a fragmentation. It is about agreeing to one common sort of global objective and then understanding that there are multiple ways uh, to actually get there and have the conversations with the development partners in terms of what is more in line with their own uh, development objective. So it's, a, it's also, again, uh, about a shift in the mindset, not seeing new and, and, and growing actors as competition, but rather as additional partners to actually achieve uh, the global goals that we all agree to. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Pilani. Even one more question to you. You were saying we should also, we have development challenges um, in all parts of the world, including uh, better off countries, OECD countries. So why not to think about uh, South North uh, cooperation? Would you stick to the idea of ring fencing specific resources, development cooperation resources for? what we call nowadays developing countries, or is this also something what is obsolete in the future? No, I think that we should uh, keep. I think the commitments that uh, have, have, have uh, you know, I, I don't think we should sort of let uh, um, so-called developed countries off the hook yet. Uh, I think uh, they should still uh, stick you know, to uh, their obligations and, 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 and that should remain important whilst recognizing that in order to achieve some of the development goals, they actually are presented with a greater amount of potential partners to work with. So I don't think we should, um, I don't think it's absolute. And I think at the moment uh, it is still something we should keep.
we can open that discussion, I think, in 2030. Okay, okay. So let's wait for 2030. Thank you, Filani. Let me turn to Annalisa from ODI. So what is your view on future of development cooperation? Many things to think of. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Not a really easy question. I mean, uh, the system of international cooperation might need a major kind of overall. Uh, that's our ambition. But the reality is about kind of marginal improvements. And I kind of substantiate what I mean by that. Just at the beginning of the pandemic, I argued that uh, the COVID-19 crisis might have accelerated uh, a trend uh, away from traditional modalities of development cooperation, uh, donor recipient ones, as also we discussed just in a second ago with Filani, towards uh, an approach uh, of true international cooperation between countries to tackle uh, global challenges. Why have I argued that at that time? First of all, we need to remember how the lines between northern and southern donors were quite blurred at the beginning of the crisis. I mean, when many kind of countries in Europe actually received support at the very beginning of the crisis with, from southern countries. Uh, second, uh, the role of knowledge sharing and peer learning was very much at the heart uh, of the solution towards the pandemic. Uh, and third, we needed a kind of a solution to tackle uh, a big, big global problem. I have to say that my optimism was wrong. Um, and instead of a kind of stronger shift towards international cooperation between countries to tackle a big crisis, actually we have seen kind of greater competition and the creation of form of mini multilateralism. Don't get me wrong, I mean, given the circumstances, many donors have actually put in place uh, uh, response packages to the COVID-19 crisis uh, at scale uh, and actually relatively quickly. I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, the World Bank, the soft window of the World Bank IDA actually managed to double uh, the volume of projects in a year between 2019 and 2020. We're talking about 30 billion US dollars. And also, uh, we managed, we advocated at that time uh, to bring uh, the replenishment of IDA forward by a year, something unprecedented that actually happened uh, um, last year. Uh, Minister Schmidt remember, uh, recalled us uh, yesterday about the achievements of the global minimum tax, uh, corporate tax. Uh, donors have never been so generous as in 2020 and 2021. But again, uh, my, to a certain extent at that time, I have to say, my expectation of even of others was that uh, with the kind of situation of the, of the crisis, the old barriers that, and constraints that uh, prevented change in the past uh, could have been removed uh, if there was the willingness to do so. But again, I don't share that optimism any longer. The Building Back Better agenda is somehow stalled, and it was well before the, the uh, start of the pandemic of the um, war in Ukraine. Second, uh, I've never come across in my, own, in my career um, um, across any kind of challenge like vaccinating uh, the world uh, so easy to explain uh, to taxpayers uh, because it kind of meets uh, a global goal, uh, but also kind of uh, meets the kind of donor interest to kind of prevent the spread of the virus. And we need to recall, we didn't talk about that yesterday, COVAX in 2021 remains overly underfunded. And my final point, uh, yes, uh, donors have never been so generous as in 2020 and 2021, despite all the kind of grim uh, prospects. Uh, but we need to put the increase in ODA into perspective. It was 0.05% uh, of the global fiscal stimuli, stimuli packages that OECD countries put together. So. I'm somehow not particularly hopeful about the kind of future, but I think there are certain kind of uh, areas for marginal improvement that uh, where, where we can work together and improve. Thank you so much, Annalisa. Many, many interesting points. Let me also follow up with uh, one, maybe even two questions. The first one, um, yes, the volume of uh, ODA resources is um, at a peak. Yeah. At the same time, I think OECD countries never we are trying to achieve so many self-oriented goals with ODA. Isn't it a contradiction? Well, there's a kind of, uh, one of the kind of elements in the future of development cooperation is the kind of realization that uh, development cooperation is uh, one of the tools for foreign policy. So certainly there's a kind of an element of kind of pursuing a national interest. Then there's another element around counting ODA and that particular terms uh, 
to what extent certain kind of elements, and I'm talking about the vaccine purchases that actually contributed to the kind of rise in ODA should be counted and how should be counted. So there's a different kind of element between the kind of motivations and what should be counted mm -hmm. under ODA. Mm -hmm. Thank you. W one more question. You did great research on countries which graduated from the status of uh, developing country to, uh, to a new status, so phasing out and uh, uh, also becoming donors. Um, are we going to see a large increase of those countries who are going to graduate from the developing country status in the, in the near future? And what does it mean for development cooperation? So are we going to see a decreasing need because the number of developing countries is going to decrease further? Well, I mean, the optimism that we have over the past decade of many countries moving away from low, in, low income country status, middle income country status might no longer be there. I mean, we estimated uh, that in the next kind of 10 years, the kind of graduation from middle income country status will kind of slow down massively. But we shouldn't think about uh, middle income, low income and high income countries. I mean, to a certain extent, we shouldn't think about graduation any longer. I mean, uh, that's a kind of... Uh, cooperation is for all countries, then there are different instruments. I mean, uh, grants and concessional financing to be kind of uh, to focus and concentrate on low income countries uh, and using different tools uh, for policy dialogue with high income countries. Mm -hmm. But the needs are there and I would argue against graduation. Okay. By means. Thank you. That would be a great uh, discussion for later on how to replace the graduation system or thinking about uh, graduation. Thank you. Let me turn to Andrea. Andrea, what is your thinking? What is the thinking of Southern Voice when it comes to the future of development cooperation? Is it a bright future? Is it a different future? Please let us know. Thank you, Stefan. Um, well, I think that the discussion um, of development uh, cooperation, and you brought this up in your initial discussions, we've lost a little bit of the of the focus on the on on development effectiveness and some of those principles and i would want to go back to 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 the issue of ownership now and i think um uh, that one uh, critical thing moving forward into the future is kind of thinking uh, how should this principle of ownership uh, in cooperation evolve. Um, and uh, I think that uh, it would be wise for us to start thinking uh, how it go, it's going to evolve, not only uh, about talking uh, about the prior that ownership means uh, working in the priorities of developing countries, but also giving them more agency about how to decide of the development finance uh, that that um, that reaches them in different forms through grants or uh, through through loans and so on. So I think that uh, in the future we should be starting to move from a discussion around ownership to a more um, decentralization of development finance. And by this, I mean uh, strengthening the position of more uh, regional bodies that can um, take decisions and where decisions can be decentralized uh, much more. And I think this is important also uh, as seeing from, from the crisis and the importance of being able to, um, to respond uh, quickly. Uh, so I think um, just, just to give an example right now, the. You know, it's it's in discussion the replenishment of the African um, Development Fund, uh, which will, uh, you know, it's estimated that it will be a ten billion uh, replenishment, and that's that's just about um, ten percent uh, of uh, the ODA that was registered last year by the OECD. So it would be um, interesting to see this grow, to see the capacity of the African Development Bank and other regional institutions in the same way to uh, have more saying, not only about the policy priorities, but also of the instruments and how to use those, the, that financing later on. So I think um, this is a bit of a direction that we should start thinking of uh, moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea, uh, and thank you for your focus on ownership and decentralization or uh, uh, localization of, um, of, of development cooperation. Just a few follow-up questions on, on, on this. Uh, my, my first one would be, um, does it also imply a different uh, um, structure of ownership on the ground? So who should own? what is implemented? Is it mainly 
governmental institutions, um, how to bring in civil society organizations. Um, so can you explain a bit uh, what kind of ownership structure do you have in mind when it comes to a more decentralized approach? Well, I think that the discussion so far has focused on um, decentralization in the in the planning stage. So we usually think about, uh, you know, there is ownership if a program uh, or a project is aligned with the national priorities or it is, you know, being implemented with the support of um, national and local partners. But the decision on the funding still done at the donor level, right? So it, it's still waiting to, as uh, uh, Annalisa mentioned, the generosity of the donors for financing them. So I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting is that beyond these, um, these uh, ownership at the priorities or planning stage, we need to move into strengthening the instruments that give different uh, regions uh, the decision power on how to distribute those funds. Uh, so not only about who is implementing it, but how and through which instruments uh, we are funding them. Thank you, Andrea. One more question. I think it was also mentioned already here during yesterday's discussion that um, in the context of South South Corporation, South South Corporation actors quite often claim that um, um, South South Corporation is much more demand driven, so uh, you could expect that ownership is uh, much more visible in a way. Uh, how is your experience? Do we have uh, different approaches when, when it comes to, to ownership, um, um, if you compare South South Corporation and ODA from, from OECD countries? Um, do you see any kind of distinction between both approaches? Is there something like a common pattern? Uh, well, Stefan, I think that the question of ownership there is more about the, um, the diversity of uh, funds available to, to, to governments. And I think that the, the um, uh, plurality that Filani mentioned comes into play here uh, in that the, the ownership um, that I think is, is positive is when the government has the possibility of uh, fund um, different projects through uh, these different sources, because as we know, uh, you know, ODA uh, has not always been uh, aligned with financing all sorts of of needs for for government. So I think it's not it's um, it's not really about is there more ownership in one type of funding than the other one, it is that the governments are able to exercise their agency and their ownership um, by being able to decide between different sources of, of, of financing um, and of working with different partners. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. Let me turn to Deb. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Deb has a lot of uh, background and experiences um, in terms of advocacy. Um, uh, in the area of development cooperation, but also doing a lot of um, uh, research in the field of development cooperation. I know at least about one quite big uh, research project exactly on this topic. So what kind of expectation do you have for the future of development cooperation? How bright is the future? How dark is the future? Deb, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much for inviting me into this panel. Uh, I just uh, wanted to recall that uh, two and a half years back uh, in Seoul on the, on the, on the Busan conference, uh, you were there uh, in, in, in December 2019, I addressed this, this particular issue in my keynote address at the inaugural session. And by reviewing the landscape of the development cooperation, traditional and South-South. I, I observed that there are pent-up issues, unattended issues in the development cooperation, uh, starting from the fragmentation of the cooperation architecture and also modalities and approaches. But there are also the changing uh, composition of the actors, the new actors coming in, the new uh, instruments are coming in like blended finance and vertical funds. Uh, we are having the new actors within that, the private philanthropy playing a significant role in certain sectors. Uh, 
and private sector. The changing profile of the list of, uh, of the recipient countries mentioned by Annalisa as well. Uh, then we had this whole, uh, you know, competing priorities with the global public goods, the humanitarian assistance, and etc. And I suggested that uh, possibly it is time to take a pause and rethink how the development co cooperation architecture will evolve in the future. And I suggested that three major uh, approaches can be thought of. And I borrowed the most uh, highly consumed product, Coca-Cola, for that matter, and said we could have Coca-Cola zero, uh, which essentially would mean that we don't do anything new. We carry on as usual. We can uh, do Coca-Cola plus, and that would mean that a bit more of the same, but in adapting to some of the new realities. And the third, Coca-Cola 2.0, where we rethink some of the framework issues, the principles, and the modalities, and how do we absorb that. Those three things, uh, three approaches. So you still have those three in front of you. But during the recent three months, uh, two and a half years, at least I will underscore three major changes have taken place in the context. The first and foremost, of course, is the loss of political traction for development cooperation in the OECD countries, in the DAC countries. The political traction has significantly gone down in the, de in the developed countries, in the DAC countries. Uh, it is reflected in their electoral results. It is reflected in, uh, in their uh, you know, the conduct of uh, allocative priorities and also the amount they're, they're able to give, including those who had block, uh, locked in the 0.7% in their uh, constitutionally or regulatory. Um, uh, so this is one. The second change which has taken place during the last two and a half years is that the South-South cooperation has risen to the occasion during the COVID. You cannot think of any field where the South-South cooperation has not contributed in mitigating the aftermath or the scourge of the pandemic. Whether it is vaccinations, supply of vaccines, whether it is medical help and giving medical support in, in distant countries within the South, uh, and then, of course, the financial help and new forms of support. A country like Bangladesh, who also swapped money with Sri Lanka, of $250 million, which was unthinkable earlier. So new forms of South-South cooperation has emerged, which needs to be taken note of. Last, not the least, uh, the third changes which we have seen because of the Ukraine crisis, that 30 to 40 odd countries from the developing world could not align themselves with the G7 narrative. And as a whole, they have abstained from voting. All this, most of these countries, are definitely dependent on ODA and other forms of development cooperation. And so there is a disjuncture between the political narrative and the development narrative. So these three things I would like to underscore, the, the issue of fall in political support within the DAC OECD, then the rise of the South-South cooperation during pandemic, and third, the misalignment between the political and development narrative as perceived from the South. My solution or the recommendation in this case, sitting in this house, and with the G7, all the think tanks around here, I think G7 and G20 can play a role in this regard by creating a safe space for rethinking and revisiting all these issues in a non-negotiating, non-power play circumstances to rethink the future. And I think in that shared value, and also in terms of being more inclusive, I think we could put forward something. It will be preposterous on my part to be presumptuous and think of a future which is so complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Depp. Uh, thank you for, for very important uh, points. Maybe just to, to follow up on, on some aspects. Um, uh, I think uh, some of us remember 2011, there was this high-level meeting on aid effectiveness in Busan, South Korea. It was a very important turning point because uh, it was a transformation from the old uh, OECD aid effectiveness working party approach to the new uh, global partnership on effective development cooperation. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton was there, a number of heads of state, so that was, was important. What you are saying is we have less attractiveness nowadays, and my question is not, um, so my, I mean this is a fact, but my question is should we try to create again 
a momentum for aid effectiveness? Or is yeah. the context nowadays so different that we need to provide a different form of evidence for yes. policymakers? Stefan, you know, I, Albert Einstein said, it is insanity to think that you go on repeating the same experiment number of times and expect different results. So the experiment has to be changed. That is the whole point. And that is the thinking which I think the think tankers are supposed to do to show the pathway for that. And my whole point is that the, you have the Geneva conference coming up in the end of this year. A high level meeting is going to take place. O GPEDC is trying to mend here and there particularly the monitoring exercise, which is the jewel in the crown in GPEDC. But we don't see fundamental rethinking in this part. So how do you really bring those fundamental rethinking in the global architecture in the changed circumstances? I think this is where it demands leadership, it demands courage, it demands empiricism, and of course, a shared value on which we look towards a unified future in, in this world. So I think this is the time for that inflection time. It has never been so hard and so demanding in the past. So I would think this is the time we should grab it and the think tankers should make the contribution to make our political leaders act accordingly. Great, uh, maybe one last challenge to you. Um, you can draft one sentence for the G7 outcome document on development cooperation. What is your sentence? Uh, I think uh, my colleagues have given a number of sentences already by now. <laughs> my whole point <laughs> is that uh, uh, retreat, rethink, and re recompose yourself and go forward. Okay, okay, great. Before we open um, and ask the floor uh, uh, for, for your comments and questions, and we might have also some chat uh, questions and comments, um, or I at least uh, invite online participants to to um, use the chat function. Let me, let me uh, turn to my great panelists for, for another round. Um, maybe I raise two points and you can choose um, to respond to one. Um, uh, international climate uh, finance. I think this is a big topic. Um, uh, quite often those um, communities are quite different. Um, we know that we have a Copenhagen uh, agreement 2009 that international climate finance for developing countries should be at least 100 billion per year. And uh, we all know that uh, the evidence basis is a bit uh, vague. And, um, but what we all see is that um, the share of ODA or development cooperation resources for international climate finance is increasing. So. Um, and, and my question is, uh, what, what is your view, your assessment on this? Is it rather, oh, this is a negative trend because uh, those resources should be, should be uh, used for, for other purposes? Or is it because we have this kind of need and uh, we have all those constraints in OECD countries that we shouldn't expect that this is really on top? Yeah, and just to give you one example here in Germany, uh, around 85% of international climate finance is, is coming from ODA resources. My second question, of course, the Ukraine uh, uh, situation, the Russian aggression in the Ukraine is um, changing something. How is it changing development cooperation with a midterm perspective? Yeah, is it changing the narrative? Yeah. Um, is it changing the allocation pattern? Yeah, are European countries now um, going to spend much more ODA resources for uh, Eastern European countries? Um, how is it changing? And um, maybe you can choose one of those uh, big questions. And uh, let me start again with uh, Pilani. What is, what is your response to one of those questions? Um, so I'll tackle the uh, Ukraine uh, challenge. Um, I think the the perception from you know policymakers, um, um, from researchers um, in in not only in South Africa but in other parts of the continent, the perception is that um, following the EU Africa summit and the many pledges that were made uh, during uh, the EU Africa summit. Uh, there is the current uh, conflict in Ukraine puts a question mark uh, 
uh, to the ability and appetite of uh, the EU uh, to basically remain committed um, towards operationalizing some of those uh, earlier pledges. Uh, but this is something that also has, you know, even outside of this uh, particular conflict, it's been a question mark, you know, following summits, the pledges, and, and, and then the task of actually of implementation. So the view is generally that perhaps there will be less appetite um, and, and, and that the resources uh, will be diverted um, to uh, Ukraine not only a, a diversion of resources, but even the appetite to actually remain engaged uh, globally, to remain engaged, particularly in the global south. And this is sort of building on what uh, Deb was saying about the changing political landscape, even within uh, G7 countries and within OECD countries, that um, there is a, a, a sort of a stalling of that appetite for uh, greater development cooperation. And also when there is uh, appetite, uh, there's question marks towards the particular projects and, and, and where those funds are actually being uh, diverted. So the conflict will definitely have an impact. And I think what it's going to do is to accelerate um, the necessity for greater regional cooperation or for actors within the regions to actually play a more uh, proactive role, uh, whether it's through the strengthening of those regional cooperation mechanisms or whether it's just greater regional coordination when it comes to engaging um, the international development uh, landscape and some of the key partners there. So there's definitely the perception that um, there will be less appetite, um, there will be less resources actually flowing uh, to uh, the, um, you know, countries, let's say in Africa and in, other, in, and in other regions of the global south. And that is really, I think, um, uh, something that does need to be tackled but it is made rather difficult by the internal political dynamics uh, within uh, the G7 countries and OECD countries. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Pilani. Thank you. Annalisa, what is your response to one of those questions? Um, tackling uh, the one on climate change and ODA, it's not the easiest one at all. So, um, I mean, the question you raised, uh, Stefan, around the kind of implications of rising commitments towards climate, uh, towards the climate finance target uh, and the implications for ODA is a kind of a, a really good one. Early analysis that we carried out uh, actually showed that, that not necessarily there's been a kind of a sectoral shift uh, in the allocation of ODA towards kind of sectors that are more kind of uh, climate change intense. So what really happened is within the kind of sector, a greater proportion of projects are actually meeting climate change objectives. And I'm talking about primarily energy, transport, the water and sanitation. But now you need to kind of square the circle. I mean, uh, I mean, protecting ODA for other challenges and also meeting the climate change uh, 100 billion uh, um, financial target. Uh, and partially, we already have the solution in there. These are the multilateral development banks. Uh, we shouldn't kind of forget that the likes of the World Bank, the African Development Bank that uh, Andrea just mentioned, actually have really helped uh, getting closer to the 100 billion target. I mean, they contributed more than 40% of the target. Um, and I would like to kind of cite an important point that probably not many are kind of appreciate uh, since its establishment in 1944, the World Bank managed to kind of lend an amount that's 40 times greater than the paid-in capital of shareholders, so 40 times. And the paid-in capital of shareholders is actually equivalent to 10%, less than 10% now, of annual, I repeat, annual ODA. So because of the kind of financing model of the multilateral development banks, there's a really kind of large leveraging effect. Uh, we ask a lot to the multilateral development banks, and there are two different ways. You can do much more with the capital you have, uh, or you expand the kind of pie. 
Just to kind of uh, a brief reminder, in the context of the G20, the Italian presidency of the G20 mandated a group of experts to look into options to improve the capital adequacy frameworks of multilateral development banks. They're finalizing the recommendations, so watch this space. It will be kind of released uh, next month. And second, uh, I mean, I mean, making stretching the balance sheets is one option, uh, but it's not a kind of uh, a sufficient condition for the kind of scale of the challenges that we have ahead. Uh, we need to invest more in multilateral development banks, and here comes uh, the G7 shareholders, and it's very much kind of investing uh, in general capital increases and in the replenishment rounds. I mean, Andrea mentioned that the 10 billion uh, for the African Development Fund. Uh, it seems a lot, uh, but either with all other different ways, I mean, using its own capital, uh, reflows uh, is 93 billion. So there's a big kind of challenge ahead of us, and I think the MDBs can play a role in meeting the climate finance target. Okay. Thank you so much, Annalisa. I think that's a very important topic, the financing uh, model of, uh, of the multilateral development banks. Andrea, what is uh, your choice? I'll go back to, to Ukraine. Um, I think uh, building upon um, Vilani's comments, uh, I think that indeed the, um, the conflict and, 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 the, and the responses so far may be pushing uh, countries uh, across the global south to be thinking more uh, that really they need to, to develop their capacity to be more self-reliant. And here um, we go back again to kind of like, where are the financing decisions um, being made in the global north. So these, we, these month only, right? We have um, the Ukraine bill in the US that talks about 40 billion in, in, in cooperation with Ukraine. Uh, we've just been talking about the 10 billion that, um, the Af uh, that it's being asked for the African uh, Development Fund. The, um, the uh, agreement on supporting COVAX, but COVAX was just uh, 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 3 billion uh, at the beginning of the month. Uh, but then, of course, during all the crisis, the, the global economies were able to uh, mobilize over 10 trillion in their own um, development, uh, you know, packages and, and support packages. So um, I think all these, all these facts point towards the, the, the need of, of countries in the global south to start being more, more um, resilient and dependent on each other. And, and Deb also shared uh, some of these in between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Uh, the question is how can this happen at the regional level and how can, uh, you know, beyond Africa that has a progress in, in cooperation at the regional level, how can this happen in the other regions of the world where regional cooperation, uh, both political, financial and so on, um, are, have not progressed as much, but I, hopefully uh, this is a push in that direction. Thank you so much, Andrea. Deb, what is your response? Uh, Stefan, uh, I have the worry that the traditional development cooperation may be becoming, is going to become instinct, uh, extinct uh, if it does not adjust to the new realities. Uh, the, the, if you go to any developing country, uh, most of the traditional DAC OECD development partners are closing down their development cooperation division. At this moment, the first secretary for political affairs or the first secretary for economic cooperation, trade investment finance, is much more powerful than the development cooperation handling first secretary. That is the reality on the ground. So one would understand how the diminishing circumstances. Now, this whole, you take the Ukraine issues and the future, a lot will depend how the Ukraine issues re get resolved, and I hope it gets resolved. So that will determine a large part how the global governance, not only of development cooperation, but also technological innovation, digital interaction, supply chains, global supply chains, the maritime logistics and other issues, all these things will take a new shift and financial cooperation and everything else. So developing cooperation cannot develop in isolation from all these changes which are going to happen. If there is one good thing 
happen from any crisis is that to see the opportunity. This is the opportunity for development cooperation to take this crisis and adjust itself to the new realities and play a role which is yet to be serviced as we have committed. I hope and pray we have that leadership, that courage, that competence, and that inclusivity to take that opportunity head on. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. So let's use uh, the opportunity and to engage uh, with the audience. So we have uh, uh, some minutes for your comments, your questions. Please introduce yourself and use those uh, microphones here on the left hand and the right hand side. Um, yeah. Yep. Hi, my name is Gina Cortez from Colombia. I'm a UN Global Changer Ambassador, and we have discussed a lot uh, in terms of the international and like the big scale, but I would like to address a little bit what happens in the local territories and in the communities and the different barriers to access to that finance that comes as yeah, our name as development cooperation. For instance, I think we have not discussed a lot how there are multiple barriers that do not allow women, gender non-conforming or different grassroots organizations to access to that funding. There are certain barriers, so most of finance or climate finance is given as a loan. And if you are the woman that perform mainly care work, unpaid and unrecognized work in which you don't have access to land tenure rights, then you're already having different elements that are going to give you a barrier to access to that loans. When the women organize themselves, either as cooperatives or NGOs or different type of structures and they apply, the same uh, proposal mechanism to these donors has a lot of barriers. It's a lot of, there is a lot of focus on outputs instead of substantive changes and transformation. And it's just delivering, delivering something to feed the same economic system that is giving a barrier to the same woman. So how is this really changing? How is this development, the cooperation and this narrative really serving those communities and those people that should serve? Thanks. Thank you so much for, for this uh, illustration and very important uh, example. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Dina Fakusa. I'm a researcher in the Middle East and North Africa and associate fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Actually, I have a question to Filani and to Andrea. Uh, to Filani, you talked about you know, the changing landscape of development cooperation. There is diversification, there's pragmatism, but you also talked about the new narratives. Could you elaborate a bit more what precisely um, you meant by this and, and how does this narrative look like compared to the one of the traditional development cooperation. And to Andrea, you talked about, you know, decentralization of financing. Um, and I was wondering, uh, upon which criteria would you base the decision to decentralize in a certain case on a certain country? Are there any criteria that you deem necessary when really giving so much agency and ownership, maybe to a government or to an, uh, an organization? Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have more comments, more questions to the gentleman over there? Thank you very much. Uh, Georgios Kostakos from the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability. We heard uh, yesterday that, uh, let's say, China gives assistance and then 80% of that goes to Chinese companies. I'm sure something similar happens with Western uh, assistance. So what is left eventually to the actual countries? And what is this all this fuss about in, in Multilateral Fora, where we spend so much time negotiating about peanuts, which eventually gets there. Some of it also is used for corruption and other things, de facto. So I think the new narrative or something like that, what does the panel think about uh, pushing for more um, money going through multilateral organizations, but not now owned? Some of them are owned by the EU almost, because it is like uh, uh, bits of the EU that they respond to. But to really go to multilateral organizations for the autonomous development of the countries, meaning to be self-sufficient in terms of food, to have developed their own expertise and not need to put an end to until when we need this development assistance. Is that possible? 2030 was mentioned at some point as a target. Is that for that? Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm so glad that I'm just the moderator today, um, not a panelist who need to respond. More questions or comments? Axel, your own question or from the chat? That's a question from the chat. I would have my own, but perhaps <laughs> later. <laughs> so it's a, a question from the chat. What mechanisms um, are developing or yeah, developing for global, uh, global funds to coordinate with existing accountability mechanisms? at international and regional level. How can these green, blue climate humanitarian funds be responsible to those monitoring integrators and, um, and enable donors to assure funds are used appropriately? So it's about ac accountability. Thank you. Do you want to add your own question? No. OK. Any further question, comment? No. Um, I think we have already a lot on the plate, um, so let's have a final round. Let's turn around the order this time. So we start with Deb, and uh, for the, uh, not for Deb because I asked this question already. So for the other three, uh, Andrea, Annalisa, and Pilani, please give to us your, your sentence for the G7 outcome document on the future of development cooperation. That would be great. So let's start with Deb. Um, what are your responses yeah. to those uh, challenging questions? Uh, I want to respond to the question raised regarding the, you know, getting not good value for money and what is coming in terms of the sometimes because of conditional aid and also the issue of uh, the, the, the various kinds of funds issues. Then. I think one issue which we do not really address quite often is the eligibility criteria of recipient of those who are, who are eligible for receipt of ODA grant and concessional finance. It is usually based on per capita income. And as you will see the profile that the most of the countries have become low middle income countries, but with a lot of structural vulnerabilities, particularly the small island states and others. So I think it is time for to have that kind of more bit more efficient allocation and use apart from untying of aid using country uh, financial management systems and procurement system competitive behavior, all these things, but also there is a need to review the uh, eligibility criteria for various reasons, but that, that was one of the, but coming back on that, you know, I guess we can go on discussing all the problems of development cooperation, traditional development cooperation, but it will not take us anywhere further. I'm just, I'm being now very arrogant over here. And I'm asserting that this is the moment if we do not do a radical rethinking of the structures and the frameworks and the principles at this moment, then the traditional development cooperation is a dying breed. And I don't think by the time we get in, I come back to Berlin, I won't need to be in this panel anymore. So I again urge all of you to look forward, look beyond the structures and look at the changing context and put the shared objective on, the, on, the pan, uh, on our horizon and see how we can achieve them together in a new format, in a new scene. And G7 meeting coming up would be a good forum, and G20, of course, would be a good forum to give some guidance on that, how we can look at it in a non-negotiating framework. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb, for a very clear final statement. Andrea, what is your uh, response to those questions here? Well, I think to the specific question of how would decentralization look like, um, I think it's 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 a long way, right? We're talking about a, a, a long future ahead, um, but I think that it, it starts with some of the um, regional development banks that uh, we've been discussing uh, so far. And for example, um, the African Development Bank, which is raising, like like we discussed, 10 billion when AIDA was in, in the 93 billion with many different, with uh, a lot of similarity in terms of the countries that they cover and the type of funding that is, that is given. Um, and uh, already uh, the uh, African Development Bank has uh, strong standing in terms of their of their practices and so on. So it should be feasible. I think that uh, later on it would be interesting to see how this can evolve into into other levels with with governments and subnational governments and so on. Um, but I think that to start with at the regional level, the the structure is there to to move in that in that direction. Um, and I think that connecting these with with um, the question about the the final benefit 
beneficiaries, uh, it's, it, it relates um, very similarly that it's, it's not only like, uh, like the question, like the example we're sharing, it's not only about who's defining what are the, the projects, the priorities, but the, the, the financial decision and how to move that financial decision closer to the, closer to the beneficiaries. Uh, so I think that, that's, um, that's, that should be the priority of closing down that distance between the financial decision and the beneficiaries. And that would, um, I think, uh, strengthen the, um, the efficacy of this financing, um, both in development and also in climate. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Um, can you just help us out with uh, drafting one sentence for the outcome document? And I think that if the um, G7 countries can can commit to this uh, moving forward to strengthening uh, for now the, the regional um, banks, um, that would be great. Okay, okay. I think you have one friend here at least, uh, Annalisa. Shall I reply to a couple of questions uh, very quickly? I mean, Gina, your kind of point uh, around uh, localizing uh, the development agenda, particularly kind of working and the challenges uh, of, of local actors. I mean, there's an issue here around risk taking uh, by development partners. And uh, this is a kind of a long standing debate, especially when uh, uh, somehow responding to taxpayers uh, is important in the kind of domestic agenda. We haven't talked a lot about the philanthropic uh, organization and philanthropic capital we they have uh, more patience I mean it's kind of uh, they can deal with this kind of issues in a different way so we should kind of uh, when we talk about the future of development cooperation we should also kind of bearing in mind that there were some of them are even bigger than uh, than the development cooperation of my own country just to give you an example and George just on your kind of question around uh, the role of uh, somehow of development partners themselves delivering kind of project it's not only about China actually many for many G7 countries actually most of their development cooperation is delivered by their own companies they kind of win I'm not I don't have the kind of figures for some G7 countries but they're more than 90 percent for some of them in the case of the of the multilateral system it's a, a public procurement process so the best kind of companies do win many of them are Chinese but also the other kind of G7 countries we argued a lot I know there are some there's an element of kind of openness and best standards in there but we also argued much more to kind of give space for local companies because they have much more kind of ability to generate jobs create kind of opportunities and long-term impact we been arguing for that even in the context of the World Bank. Uh, my kind of plea for the G7, I'm somehow kind of uh, um, building on what kind of uh, Andrea mentioned and I'm, I'm very specific. I mean G7 countries are asking multilateral development banks to do more but they should also enable them to do more and that not only includes uh, stretching the balance sheets but it's committing uh, to general capital increases to some of the banks that have are going to be stretched uh, in the not so near future. Thank you so much for helping out with the drafting. Um, Pilani, what are your final remarks? Uh, yes, so <clears throat> partly to the question, so lumping the, those related to finance, so challenges with access to finance, and then also what's left behind for, develop, uh, for, for, for recipient countries. I think it's important here that um, the landscape we're moving into is also about a greater degree of um, mobilization of resources um, from the global south. So if we just take, you know, the uh, study uh, on illicit financial flows in Africa, and which shows essentially that the amount of illicit financial flows is uh, roughly the equal to uh, all official development assistance plus foreign direct investment that is actually entering uh, the continent. So Africa is a net exporter of, uh, of, 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 of capital. And if we can actually redirect and mobilize uh, uh, those domestic resources, rather than leaving the continent through illicit means, but rather channeling towards um, Africa's development priorities, I think we'll get a lot done. But we can't get it done only as Africans. We need to get it done together with countries in the G7, in the G20. Um, and then also just um, 
in terms of the narrative that is evolving, um, the narrative for me is one of, um, you know, I, it, it's one of mutual respect. It's one of mutual uh, gains. Uh, it's one that recognizes uh, that um, um, all actors, both uh, recipient and 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 uh, sort of uh, um, uh, sources of development cooperation, have particular interests and both have the capability to learn actually from each other. And then I think the lastly is that the sentence I would provide to the G7 is that the G7 welcomes the growing uh, plurality of the international development landscape and calls for joint efforts uh, to rethink the future of international cooperation alongside key actors of the global south. My goodness, this was a perfect uh, uh, sentence for the, the outcome document. Uh, thank you, Pilani. Um, so I'm not going to summarize this kind of uh, exciting discussion. It wouldn't be possible. Um, but let me just uh, thank the audience for, for great comments and questions. And it was really an honor to be um, here, the moderator for great panelists, uh, Andrea, Annalisa, Pilani, Depp. Um, that was a great, great honor for me. Uh, it was inspiring. And um, so thank you so much. And uh, let's enjoy our coffee break. I think we have a coffee break now. Thank you. Big applause for our panelists. <laughs>